Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I have uh, Brother Cripps with me as usual. Uh, Sister Renee is on her way. She'll be joining us any minute. And first, let's welcome uh, the congregation, uh, particularly all those viewing us live right now and in the chat room. Hello, everybody. Blessings to all of you. I guess the first thing we need to address is that uh, poor Celine is uh, brokenhearted. Uh, she lost her uncle uh, to cancer. So uh, let's all pray for Celine and her family to get through this time of grief. And, um, oh, Renee is here now. So, uh, Renee, Perfect I told you we be here any minute. Hey, did I hear right? Our little sister, Celine, lost her uncle. Yeah, brain she, cancer. She texts me every day, so it's unusual not to hear from her. She must really be spending time with family. I was uh, wondering what she uh she's here in the chat room now and she posted, hi sweet sister hi uh, honey i'm so sorry uh, yeah she she announced that here for all of us and asked for our prayers uh okay i'm so sorry i uh i also i had a friend i went to high school with had lung cancer and now it's gone to his brain stage four he's asking for prayers he's just put it in god's hands at this point mm -hmm. yeah well, well uh, one it's, step closer to glory. There, uh, the, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, if, if someone is in grief, we are not supposed to try to cheer them up. No. We, we are supposed to grieve along with them. That's right. Go ahead That's and right. weep along with her and uh, let her know that we feel that her pain and I'm very, very sorry, but we know yes. that that grief period will pass eventually. Right. Um, we shouldn't try to rush through it. But uh, so we understand we've, um, we've, and even, we've lost you know what? Yes. even though, even though we know they're going to be in glory and St. Paul says we're not as those without hope. It's clear to me that even St. Paul said that God had spared one of the other disciples lives. Lest Paul's grief become too much to bear. Amen. Lest he be overtaken with sorrow. So uh, even when we know they're going on to glory, you know, I've had people blow off my grief. Well, it's okay. You know, you're going to see him in heaven. It's like, what? Yes, of course we have that hope, but good gracious. We, we, we grieve uh, that death had any effect at all and that we're going to be separated from them for a while. And it's absolutely okay to be devastated. Yeah. We're just supposed to say, we love you. We, we're we so sorry you're in pain. And we're just going to sit here and, and be in pain with you. We're going to do the best we can to let you know that you're in our hearts. You know, and it's also wrong to say, well, I know how you feel. And then pop their sorrow like mine was worse than yours. You think that's bad. Well, I blah, 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 I lost. It's okay to say, hey, I've lost people I love. But your pain is personal, and I can't imagine what you're going through. But do know that I have endured similar pain, and I'm here to be here with you. But don't ever say that you are you know what they feel. You know, that's a really hard thing for someone to feel, you know, to hear in that moment. So, mm -hmm. Well, let, let me uh, say that. Uh, am I getting repeat? Something's repeating here. Okay. Uh, uh, today, uh, I felt uh, the need to call a brother, uh, Brother Anthony D'Angelo. Uh, he, he has called me quite often the last couple of months, and I hadn't heard from him for a week, and that's, that's uh, unusual. I was thinking about him and I thought, well, I'll call him. I was on my way to a doctor's appointment. So I, I tried calling him before, and um, turns out he was in the hospital and he's been there for four days. He had a stroke and uh, it doesn't look like there's going to be permanent damage, fortunately, but he's still in the hospital. So I told him, of course, I'd bring bring uh, his problem to, to the congregation and ask everybody to pray for Brother Anthony. Um, Anthony D'Angelo. Um, 
So there's problems, problems we all have to deal with in life and even in the church. Uh, uh, I'll give you a, a, a good report though. Uh, I had that procedure on my neck done yesterday. Awesome. And uh, it, I, my neck feels so much better. I, I have to have, uh, they, they kill the nerves. It's called oblation. They burn the nerves uh, in your neck um, on my, the right side of my neck. And uh, in a few weeks, I have a schedule to do the left side. But I, I certainly feel that if your nerves are dead, obviously you're not going to feel pain. Right. So uh, it, it's obviously helping me. The procedure, though, usually the, the nerves regenerate uh, and actually come back to life and you'll have the problem again. But it might be good for a year or two. Um, so I'm happy to give you that report that, uh, you know, I, I have a problem turning my neck, driving the car sometimes. If I want to make a turn, I can't turn my head enough to see if cars are coming. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. Isn't that interesting, Brother Luke, how evolution set that up so that your nerves would grow back uh, over, <laughs> over time? Yeah. Oh, that's... yeah, the uh, ingenious random universe that yep. creates order out of chaos. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're so glad, Luke. We're, I, you know, I've been concerned about your health the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, I, I saw the cardiologist again today, and uh, getting some of my medications uh, changed. That's it. Uh, but uh, that everything's going well there, so uh, I'm happy about that too. Um, all right. Uh, no more pain. No more pain, brother Luke. Eventually, the, the, this just popped in my head. I'm sure we've all thought this before, but one, what a wonderful thing when uh, it's it's not a doctor doing something. It's it, it's not someone making a temporary fix, but when we're in uh, in glory ourselves, and uh, would never have pain again. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that the, uh, the the things that we want to. Uh, not credit God for like uh, the healing and treatments we have through medicines or medical breakthroughs, uh, surgeries, even the hands of a surgeon. Oh, I, sure. still, I still give all the glory to, to Jesus to uh, no one would be able to figure out these medical breakthroughs if God doesn't reveal it. And, uh, and I trust that the God is, is God in the surgeon's hands. Absolutely. All glory, all glory to Jesus even still. I'm hey, glad I'm Brother Luke. I yeah. heard a born again surgeon, uh, actually an ER physician, say, you know, they're not allowed to pray or they can lose their job. Yep. And he felt the Holy Spirit say uh, to, because the guy was already dead, he flatlined, but he felt the Holy Spirit say, this man's not saved. Pray over him and charge the paddles one more time. And he did it, he charged the paddles, he prayed over him. And he brought the man back to life, and he did get saved. Hmm. So, you know, use doctors and medical resources, yeah. obviously. You know, um, our our dear brother, um, brother doctor Jason Jack, is a surgeon, and um, I think it would be a very interesting talk. I'll have to ask him if he wants to do it, but to talk to him about how his faith and his uh, medical practice. Uh, how they go, go together, and uh, maybe he does pray along with his patients, or maybe maybe he separates them. I don't know, but it would be interesting to get his thoughts on that. That'd be great. I'd love to see him anyway. I miss yeah. him. Yeah. Or, <clears throat> all right, so tonight we're continuing with, in 1 Corinthians. Tonight we're on chapter 9, beginning with verse 15. So um, I'll read it first in the KJV. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Verse 16 also. For, I, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to, to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Huh. I got to say first that the end of that verse 16 is, uh, is it means a lot to me. Um, particularly uh, that period of time that I was compelled 
but to go to the streets and preach the gospel in open air. And uh, uh, that's exactly how I felt. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And thankfully, we have this venue now on the internet that allows us to do it to people all over the world. Okay, verse 15 and 16, Sister Renee. Yeah, uh, uh, it looks like, just skimming through it real quick, what I missed last week is about uh, him reaping financially what he needs to continue to pre- you know, to survive while he's traveling and preaching the gospel. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot, I, I forgot that you, you, Brother Dave was here last week instead of you. And uh, yeah, that, that beginning part there was really a great part of the scriptures talking about um, the need to support ministries financially. And I did actually talk about you quite a bit in that in that uh, last week's study. Oh, yeah, how, how I get accused and stuff. Yeah, how you got, you decided to demonetize, and I made a video titled, um, Should a Minister Be Paid? And uh, the verses in this chapter here earlier were the verses that I was citing to show that Paul and then also Jesus uh, says yes. A minister uh, needs to be paid and supported. I mean, particularly if he needs it because he, he's doing it full time and, and needs to, and doesn't have any other means for support. We, we need to support them. Okay, so there's your contact, sister. So please, uh, verse 15 and 16. It sounds like, uh, based on that, he's saying, uh, look, it, it's, it's clear that God has ordained that those of us that preach the gospel, we should live from the gospel like we should be financially cared for because of the work we do um but he says but i have used none of these things neither have i written these things that it should be done be so done unto me so he's not he's saying i'm not saying this so that i can get money from you but that others it seems that others should be able to benefit from this so that they can continue to do the work and travel and have their needs met. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in Lord. And we always know that Paul glories only of Christ crucified. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He's like, this uh the gospel i preach whether you are faithful in what you're supposed to do or not which is to make uh to provide for the minister that brought you the message to begin this church to save all your souls whether you uh are faithful to doing what god says to do anyway by supporting the apostles financially and so that we can continue our work woe is unto me because i have no choice I don't have a choice here whether you help me or not. I've got to do this. It is upon me. It is a burden to my soul. I know it is my purpose that uh, God has laid upon me uh, this. Because he says, um, uh, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So it is necessary for him to preach. It is a necessity for him. It is not, he's not just talking about the necessities of needing financial and carnal things uh, for his ministry, but the necessity of having to preach. Uh, it, 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 there's, there's no choice for him. He is a slave to God. That's how he sees him uh, as a slave that, that must do it. Um, and that he said it'd be better for me to die than any man should make my glory void. But when he glories, he glories in the Lord. And if anybody were to say, hey, Paul does this for financial gain, then it might make the glorying he does in Christ void. It might make the message of none effect. So he's saying, I'm not doing this so I can benefit. But in general, this needs to be addressed. So... That's what I see there anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, I've noticed that uh, the KJV, the Amplified, and the NABRE, they end verse 16 with an exclamation point. Now, obviously, we've talked about this many times that the uh, capitalization, the uh, 
punctuation, the uh, even the, the the chapter numbers and verse of numbers, uh, that was not in the original writings. So when they started reproducing these, uh, the manuscripts, and then the printing press, and then all the, the publishers, and, and all the different translations, um, that's their take on it. But I think that this particular verse here, if we ever need a verse that has an exclamation point, this is, this is one. I'm gonna read 15 and 16 in the Amplified, Brother Cripps. Awesome. And, and then uh, get your thoughts. We also have a footnote here on the NABRE I'll look at, but in the Amplified, 15 and 16 says, but I have not made use of any of these privileges, nor am I writing this to suggest that any such provision be made for me now, for it would be better for me to die than to have anyone make void and deprive me of my ground for glorify, glorifying in this matter. Hmm. For if I merely preach the gospel, that gives me no reason to boast, for I feel compelled of necessity to do it. Woe is me if I do not preach the, the glad tidings, the gospel. Hmm. Um, I can't add much more than what Renee said. She really nailed it down, but I would agree uh, with with her interpretation of it. And uh, also uh, the idea that woe, woe to him. Yeah, of course, woe to Paul if he doesn't preach the gospel. Um, he's made it clear in other verses, too, that he he doesn't want to boast. Now, remember, this is a, this is a guy that was taken to uh, heaven and saw things, and even in that, he's saying, uh, you know, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, but a man, he doesn't even refer to himself in the first person, he refers to himself in the third person, that uh, doesn't even mention that it's him. Uh, I mean, it's obvious that it is him, but he, he did everything to avoid boasting. Um, he knew, and I believe this is the Holy Spirit revealing this to him, he knew that, if, that he had to be very, very uh, particular about everything he said, the way that he said it, and the way that things appeared. And in this instance, he's he's saying, um, at, you know, last week we talked, you know, in context about what was going on and, and uh, in verse 14, uh, to get a living from the gospel. You know, we talked a great length about that. So um, I like the way that the Amplified puts it here. He's saying that, um, uh, that it would deprive me of the boast in the matter of financial support. And he's saying, I'm not saying this so that you give it to me now. You know, this isn't why I'm bringing this up. Um, but the, the main, the main point is, uh, woe to me if I do not preach the, the good news of salvation or the gospel, um, woe to any of us. And I say this having already admitted on air that I, I have gone through this in my own life where, um, I would have, I would have gladly and did. If someone asked me what I believed, I would tell them. Uh, but I didn't make it a point to to do what I'm doing now. I, 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 um, I kept it very close to myself. It was a personal thing, um, and God brought me out of that. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit worked worked in me. And and um, although other people would not be patient, other people would accuse me and point the finger at me and say, "Well, I'm not really a believer if I'm not preaching the gospel." Um, he was patient with me and he brought me uh, to a place when I can be bold in my faith and I'm still working on it, honestly. I, I, when, I, when I think and listen to uh, the first uh, Bible uh, study that I did on this channel, um, I, I see a change in the way that I'm uh, presenting things and uh, more boldness than I, I was at the beginning. And that's all his work in me. Uh, so now I would say, that I, I do regret uh, not having spent more time in my life um, being like this, uh, saying, saying to myself, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Um, so from here on out, I will be doing that. And uh, there's no boasting in it for me. It's because he's working in me and because um, with the incredible gift of salvation that he's given to me, we should all be, we should all be preaching gospel. We should all be um, I, I like how you put it, uh, Brother Luke, that you we have a mandate, you know, that you get saved and then you should be preaching the gospel. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, I, I've made so many videos making this point that uh, we all have a duty. Uh, you see, um, Paul says that this church is is the body of Christ. The body has many parts. There's a mouth, there's ears, there's hands, and we can associate all these things with different roles. However, I think everybody is under the, the, the uh, umbrella dictate that we must preach the gospel. Um, and in addition to sharing the gospel, we... Um, we shouldn't say, well, I share the gospel, that's my uh, calling, so I don't have to use my hands, I don't have to be a servant, I don't have to you know, uh, aid the church in any other way, because my calling is just to preach the gospel. That would be a mistake. But I think uh, the biggest error is on the other side, thinking that you're doing these other things, and it's not you're not called to preach the gospel. That is the universal mandate for all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say even, I'm sorry, uh, shame on you. If you are not sharing the gospel, at least with your friends and family, and then after you've done that, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, uh, find a way to um, introduce the gospel to others, um, uh, associates, uh, even strangers. Uh, there are all kinds of techniques that we talk about to uh, stimulate that kind of a conversation. Um, it's this simple thing like when people give you this standard greeting, um, hey, oh, oh, hi, how are you doing? Well, I could say, well, I'm fantastic. On a scale of one to 10, I'm 9.75. Well, that's great. Well, the only thing that would be better is if I was dead. What? <laughs> You'd rather be dead? Are you crazy? I said, no, because to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm promised eternal life in heaven because of my faith in Jesus. You know, I see, there are, these are things that it may sound silly to you, but when you train yourself to uh, respond in those ways, it, I, I know for a long time, I was really desperate to talk about Jesus, but I didn't know how to get the conversation started. I know that many of you are you're in that same boat. You want to tell your friends and family, you want to tell everybody about Jesus and this free gift, but you don't know how to get the conversation started. Well, if you're busy in your in a ministry, even attending the chat room, participating in the chat room, this is the ministry, having fellowship with the saints, encouraging each other. Then any if anybody asks you, let's say there's a friend and they haven't seen you for a while, hey. Oh, hey, hey, nice to see you. What have you been up to? I haven't seen you for a long time. What have you been up to? I, what have I been up to? Uh, I, I've been gotten really involved in my online church. Uh, online church? What? Online? There's a church online? Yeah, we have chat rooms and, you know, we're uh, studying the Bible together. You see, if you're busy in ministry, then every conversation uh, can, uh, it can be, uh, 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 introduced to every conversation because you can honestly say well, what have I been up to this is what I've been up to uh, I don't know I, I'm, I maybe I'm ranting but I, I, I Paul says what was me if I do not preach the gospel I feel that way I hope everybody feels that way mm -hmm. um, all right let me read the notes in the NABRE on uh, these verses here um, Verses 15 through 18, the notes say, Paul now assigns a more personal motive to his non-use of his right to support. His preaching is not a service spontaneously undertaken on his part, but a stewardship imposed by a sort of divine compulsion. Yet to merit any reward, he must bring some spontaneous quality to his service. And this he does freely uh, by, by freely renouncing his right to support. The material here is quite similar to that contained in Paul's defense at 2 Corinthians 11, verses 5 through 12 and chapter 12, 11 through 18. All right, so we look forward to those uh, studies and we get there. Uh, all right. Uh, any more, Renee or Cripps, before we go to the next verses? No, sir. No, but I, you know what? I have 
a video already that I was supposed to upload later. So I'm so excited that we are discussing the end of this chapter tonight. This is one of the biggest untwisting we all got to do tonight, you guys. Nice. Nice mm. section. Well, wow, that sounds like quite a coincidence, sister. Yes. What do you think? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, a lot of us like to say there's no coincidence. It's a God incidence. I mm. like that. Yes. Christ incidence. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, let's go back to the KJV, verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. Mm. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Uh, okay, uh, well, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first on that one? Uh, for I to do this thing willingly, in, in other words, okay, so again, we all understand that we have free will. We're able to, that he did not make us robots or automatons. He didn't make us little puppets that we dance on the end of God's strings at all. He wanted us. He wanted us to choose him out of our own free will. We're not being made to. Now there are atheists out there that say, well, yeah, what do you, what do you, what, what's the choice? Either follow God or burn in hell. I mean, that's the way they look at it. They don't look at it as there, there's, there's many choices for a person to make in their own lives and this is one of them so if i do it he's saying if i do it willingly i have a reward but if against my will you know if i was being forced uh to dispense the gospel then it it, it would be a crime of god to do that um now paul's not saying that i'm saying that i'm i'm saying that um what what good would it do for us to be robots and we just we just you know do what he wants us to do under uh, under force now it's interesting that he calls us in in other uh, verses that we've done on this particular uh in this particular study he calls us slaves to righteousness that's what we are we're slaves to righteousness and yes we owe god everything um i'm happy to call myself a, a slave to god and it is my choice it is uh it is me saying to him I owe you a debt that I can never repay. So I know you don't need anything from me, but whatever I have to give, I offer it up to you. I give you all the glory that I possibly can. And I still am not doing enough. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that about myself. I'm not doing enough. Um, and I, I uh, always want to do more. And it's not, it's not to, to for, for me, it's not for some reward. It's simply because it's, it's, um, it's the best thing that I can do is serve him in whatever way possible. Mm hmm Yes. Okay. I'm dying to talk about this, but I want Renee to go first. Verse 17, Renee. All right. Uh, you know, this, I'm so glad Cripps brought up how we're not puppets because the Calvinists, you know, they hate verses like this because they'd say, you know, if you're one of the elect, you will uh, preach the gospel. You will be a servant to God willingly because that proves you're one of the elect. Uh, no. So I like that he addressed that issue of it. Uh, it seems to me here, and I, I won't, I'm not going to go far further ahead, but it will all tie together. When Paul says, uh, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. I think one of the things he's saying here is, if you do something for God, do it with your whole heart. Only then is there a, a, a chance for to be rewarded. And I believe that is not only a, an earthly reward of the fulfillment, but a literal reward in the in the eternal realm. I do. Uh, when you do it with your heart towards God, you you will have a reward. That's the only opportunity that we can actually. So when people go. Well, uh, am I going to get a reward for this? The fact that you're, you know, that, that, I don't know if that's the best mentality for it. It's great if it motivates you to serve the Lord by all means. Okay, God uses reward to motivate us. There's nothing wrong with that, working towards an end goal. Uh, but uh, I think Paul's saying if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. So if his heart is in it for God. Uh, that is the only opportunity in which he may be rewarded. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So 
it, he it, he is saying even if it's against his will, he is still responsible to dispense the gospel because God has entrusted him to dispense the gospel, whether his heart's in it or not. Um, we can see that go through with Jonah. Now, like Chris said, he does not make anybody serve him, but constant, when you belong to the Lord, you're his child, but the story of Jonah shows his consequences. You know, when you run and run and run and run. Uh, so we can see Balaam. Balaam suffered consequences. You know, uh, he was supposed to serve God and he went the other direction and worked against it. Yeah. So uh, I think what Paul's saying here is if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. If his heart is in it, then he can be rewarded. But even if he, if it's against his will, it's still, he still is supposed to dispense or give out the gospel because it's been committed unto him by God himself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, I need to divert for a moment because I um, can't help but notice in the chat room, uh, Hendrix is missing. And Brother Hendrix, um, he's probably the most dedicated, uh, devoted um, moderator in the chat room. Uh, it's the first time I can ever recall him not being there. And uh, he, he is so involved, helping so much, I would say he is a deacon in our congregation and he's not there. And I don't know why. So my, you know, my fault is I tend to worry about the people I care about if they're, I don't know why I always assume they're the worst, that maybe something's happened. So, and uh, let's have everybody, let's pray for Brother Hendricks and uh, the Lord to keep him safe and, and well. And I hope that everything's okay. Sure. I can't think of any reason why he wouldn't be here uh, if, if there wasn't a problem. All right, let's uh, let's look back at the scriptures. Uh, look, at, uh, I want to look at it. Uh, let me see. Uh, did you both did it in the? Uh, who went first on that one? Was that you, Renee? Verse seventeen, or or did Crips go first? I went first. Okay, so Renee did. It. I want to read it in the Amplified, verse seventeen. Uh, For if I do this work of my own free will, and I have my pay that is my reward but if it is not of my my own will but it is done reluctantly and under compulsion i am still entrusted with a sacred trustee uh, so a lot of interesting things uh, in, when we compare these uh kjv and the amplified here uh well, first of all, the idea of free, free will um, and ha having your reward. Um, obviously, we know that we do things of our free will, even if he com feels compelled to do it. He's, he hasn't lost his free will. He's, he's uh, surrendering his will over to the compulsion. The Holy Spirit is, is urging him on, and he recognizes that. So he exercises his free will and does it. Not that he doesn't have a choice about preaching, uh, but he feels this great compulsion. It's not like he's decided. Now, what I've seen is when I, when I first started street preaching, uh, I, I felt a compulsion to do it. I, and uh, But uh, when when he talks about the reward, and, and uh, we know that there is a judgment seat of Christ where we will get rewards for our ministries. And when I say ministry, I mean from the time you were born again until your last breath, the uh, the payroll is is building up for your rewards. Uh, all the things you do in the cause of Christ uh, will be added up, and you'll be rewarded at that judgment seat of Christ. Um, so we all have this ministry. And we all, whether you realize it or not, or whether you're consciously recognizing it and, and working at it or not, you, you, there's a, a t tally being kept on what you do. Uh, but I know that myself, and I feel this was uh, something I saw that was kind of rampant in the other three preachers, is that 
even though I felt compelled to do it, uh, I know my initial feelings about it was uh, I was really, what was the reward I was after? I wasn't really thinking. I mean, I was even asked by Jim Weber, the president of the National Street Preachers Organization. And he asked me one day, he says, Luke, why are you doing this? Is it because you care about the lost? Is it because you won't want to serve God? Uh, is it to build up rewards? And uh, uh, the rewards were the last thing on my mind. He made me start thinking about that. That really wasn't why I was doing it. But I do realize in hindsight now, part of the reward I think that Paul might be alluding to here is uh, if he was doing it, uh, let's say, uh, not of his own, not be not through compulsion, but he was just choosing to go do it, and with some other motive. What motive could it be? It could be not the judgment seat of Christ, but the rewards you get now. Like Jesus says, "Don't build up your treasures on earth; those are temporary. Build up your eternal treasures for heaven." Well, what's the temporary reward that we could have from free preaching? It's recognition, it's admiration uh, from others, and that's. I was found that I was preaching really to the other street preachers. Uh, uh, and, and I got a lot of accolades. I was voted street preacher of the year by this organization. I, I was recognized and I got a lot of, you know, uh, um, what do you call it, what's the word? Um, uh, just recognition from it. And that, 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 uh, pay, that payoff is your ego. And so I realized that well, that was a tainted um, um, motivation that I had it. But I think that many street preachers, many people who do this, they're doing it for the, this temporary reward of recognition uh, from from others, rather than, uh, as Paul says, he deserve any re reward, he, he's compelled to do it. So I didn't jumble that up too much, but uh, well, let's read it in the NABRE. Um, if I do so willingly, I have a recompense, but if unwillingly, then I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Uh, now that reminds me of something else I wanted to talk about. This word stewardship uh, in the NABRA and, and in the Amplified, it says entrusted with a sacred tr trusteeship and commission. But in the, uh, in the KJV, uh, we have a problem. Not because it's wrong, but, but because the way it's people apply it. It says, a disp dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Uh, we have to talk about this. The word dispensation, I think, appears four times uh, in, in, right around in, in this chapter here, I think is where they all are. A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. The problem we have is that there are, uh, there's a pretty large number of Christians, and I'm not challenging their faith or Christianity, uh, but they interpret the word dispensation uh, wrongly uh, and, and try. They, they want to divide uh, history up into periods where God was um, uh, dealing with man in a different way and, and uh, until this period, where, which is the church period, until this time, he had been dealing with us um, through a system of faith and works. And that is a big error. Uh, so, uh, and that's because they are, they've, I think they've been brainwashed. I got, people were offended by me using that. But if, if you've only studied a dispensational viewpoint and you haven't also studied the arguments against dispensationalism, that is brainwashing. Brainwashing is hearing one point of view and not considering the other arguments against it. So I'm sorry, it does apply to you if you haven't considered that maybe dispensationalism is wrong. But dispensation is not where God is has a 300 year period where he's dealing with people by, well, now you have to, you believe in the promised savior, but you also have to believe in following the laws of Moses or whatever. They're, there's usually seven dispensations that people refer to. Uh, each one has kind of different set of rules. But to me, the word dispensation is important. You get this right. Dispense is the root word. And to dispense is to pass out, to distribute something. Uh, so there's a, there's a little um, 
candy that I mean, many people are familiar with is called Pez. And it comes in a little dispenser. You click it and a piece of candy comes out. It's a Pez dispenser. Uh, and, you know, it's a dispensing the candy. You could go to a dispensary where they have items and they're dispensing out uh, products and stuff for you. So dispensing is distributing something, uh, making something available. And But the problem is that um, they they want to say that this dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, to Paul, and that Paul is the only one that ever did have the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Even at the beginning of history, it was always grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The only thing they didn't know is that this promised Christ, the Savior, to come. They didn't know his name was Jesus. They didn't know exactly how he's going to accomplish it. But it's always been that way. It's, it's always been the same gospel. It's just been more clarified through history. So the dispensing is not a different set of rules. The dispensing is more uh, revelation to give us more clarity to understand who this person is and what he, how he would accomplish it. So uh, that's why I think that when it says in the Amplified that I am still entrusted with a sacred trusteeship and commission, I prefer it instead of this dispensation, the way they twist that word. And in the Amplified, I mean, in the NABRE, it's phrased, then I have been entrusted with a stewardship. That makes much more sense in the context the way I've just explained it. Trump, Paul was given a stewardship to, with the gospel, but we all have the same stewardship, and uh, it's not something unique just to Paul, and it's not something that uh, is unique to today. It's always been the same gospel. I'm, I'm sorry I've gone on so long on there, but what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I'm, obviously I uh, agree completely. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. I think I think that we've uh, we've we've covered it. Renee, Renee, might, Renee, Renee might have more to add. I mean, yeah, I'm, I mean I, I'm with you on that. I just um, I don't know the the reward issue. Um, I don't, I'll I'll take more. I don't want to go forward and my comment would say something ahead of time. So I'll wait. I'll, I'll comment on that when we get to what I want to say and add to it. Oh, okay. So it's coming up, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so let's go on now to verse uh, 18 in the KJV. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So Renee, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's obviously saying that uh, he'll he'll do it without any um, desire for earthly reward of any kind, it yeah. seems like, not just financial. Um, and uh, um, that way, let me see how they worded that at the end. Um, uh, that I abuse not my power because he he does have by the way he he mentions that he has uh, much revelation and supernatural power to heal it was pretty amazing what Paul had and he could easily uh, abuse that power and profit from it in many ways either by uh, lifting his own name up or financially or what have you. Um, for but I, I think he's saying he's going to do that without any expectation earthly at all. He's giving an example. Yeah, because I'm sure people accused him too. Oh yeah. All right, brother Cripps. I'll read it in the Amplified. Verse 18 says, uh, "What then is the actual reward that I get? Just this." that in my preaching, the good news, that is the gospel, I may offer it absolutely free of expense to anybody, not taking advantage of my rights and privileges as a preacher of the gospel. Amen. Um, yeah, so he he's, he's doing it 
um, as an example, and he's not expecting any reward. That is clear. And, and I just can't help but compare him to the prosperity pastors and the multi-church pastors and what I hear from them and the way that Paul's acting. And uh, Brother Luke, you rightly stated, or Renee stated, he, he could have profited from, from the gospel in, in so many different ways. That is absolutely true. He could have exploited other people. He could have heaped himself up with a bunch of rewards. Certainly he saw Jesus with his own eyes. I mean, he, he had an encounter with, with Christ. Um, how many of us can say that, that we actually saw him with our own eyes and he audibly spoke to us? Now, there are people that say that they do, and I'm a little dubious as to whether that's true or not, whether they heard an audible voice or they, they, they saw him with their own eyes. Um, but Paul did. So he could have banked on that, literally, banked and literally and figuratively banked on that. And, um, and, you know, back then, I don't know what the equivalent to a jet would be, but I mean, he could have a, his, his own charted ship that he could travel around instead of, um, instead of just, uh, you know, just getting on whatever ships going to wherever he needed to go. Um, it could have been very different for him. And he's using an example that I wish more people would go by today. Frankly, he's used many examples. I mean, he he was the one to represent the gospel uh, in a way that other people hadn't up until that point, and it being Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added, nothing added, nothing added. Um, and he had to be an example, I believe. I believe the Holy Spirit uh, showed him uh, how not to boast, how not to set himself up as any kind of important person or the leader of the church or anything like that. Certainly he... Uh, he established his own authority so that people would listen to him and understand that what he was saying was important. Um, but he definitely was an example of, of how to, how to um, give all glory to God and preach the gospel without any uh, uh, expectation of reward in this, in this uh, world, in this temporal world. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you're wrong, uh, you and Renee, in regard, regards of broadening it, uh, in saying that uh, this he's talking about not expecting a reward of any kind in this life. Um, that very well be the case. But I, I do think that in the context, when we look back to the previous verses, and even the fact that he says, without charge, that this verse is really just still talking about the same issue about uh, the money. And, and that, so he, uh, uh, he, that's the kind of uh, reward that he's referring to here. Just, hey, I don't want anybody to be confused that because I'm talking about that a, a minister should be supported. And sometimes we ask to raise money that I don't want, I'm very much concerned that that could be misconstrued to think that we're in it for the money. So that's, that's what I think the, the main point is that he's making. Uh, all right, let's go back to KGV verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Brother Cripps? I made myself a servant to everyone so that I may win more for Christ. Yeah, so... So this part, to me, he's delighting in the fact that he is a servant. He's a free man. He's choosing by his own choice with free will uh, to make himself. He says, I have made myself a slave to everyone. And, and then states the purpose. The purpose is that he may win more for Christ. Um, and I believe this goes back into a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about all the reasons why he stays sing single and why he's suggesting other people stay single uh, just for the purpose of it. You can serve God more. You have, you have less distraction uh, from the temporal things in this world. You, you wouldn't have to focus on your, your spouse and a family as much um, as you would be able to focus on the gospel. So it's, it's, it's the same point. He's saying, uh, I am free uh, from all men. He, he is free. He's not a slave to anyone else, but he made himself a slave. Uh, in order to win more for Christ. I think it's pretty pretty clear. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to see the thing with verse 19 when he says, uh, for though I be free from all men. Uh, that I didn't wasn't clear to me, but Renee, I'm going to read it in the Amplified, verse 19 in the Amplified. It says, for although I am free in every way from anyone's control, I have made myself a bondservant to everyone so that I might gain the more for Christ. Renee? Um, yeah, actually, this can confirm what you were saying, that it is more leaning specifically toward financial reward because, uh, you know, like Cripps points out, Paul says the same thing over and over again, but says it in different ways when he wants to get the point across. Yeah. And here he uh, says right before that was what's my reward, right? And then it says uh, without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, that I've made myself servant unto all. So because he's doing this without charge, he is serving not only God, but men so without charge he is doing it in service to them without any expectation of financial gain or reward at all yeah. so um i think that's the reference there when he's talking about uh, a servant unto all so uh, that i might gain the more uh if he if he does that and then he explains how later uh, if, if he's doing that without charge, and know he doesn't have the motive, then that can be wiped out of the way and he can gain the more. But it's obviously in context of what you were saying, Luke, that without charge is financial. So because he's not getting any financial reward, he is a servant even unto men because he's serving them and they're not uh, benefiting him in any way. He's just serving them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and an, an, another thing about when you're accepting payment from people, in a way, it puts you under their uh, control because uh, they're uh, if you're relying on their payment, and they and they have an expectation that right. they're paying you, so you better. Uh, how many times does a pastor get in trouble because he's not preaching the way the board of directors is requiring it, and right. they're the ones that are paying him? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, glad you brought that up. All right, let's go to, ver I'm going to read 20 and 21 together, uh, Crips. Uh, uh, or no, Renee, you go first on this one. In the KJV, 20 and 21 says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. There you go. Yeah, this is a yeah. uh, one that a lot of people try to twist up and say, see, you are still under the law. Get it, Renee. Yeah. But it's it, the law, on a law to Christ, it, it means that, you know, uh, the law of love. So, um, when he says and he became a Jew and then to them that are without the law, meaning the Gentiles, he's referring to the Gentiles. Yeah. And that's why he says as without the law. So the Jews, he's going to observe their law traditions, yeah. their food traditions, their Sabbaths, their, because he, he was a Pharisee and a son of a Pharisee. And he knows that if you don't observe these things, they will not listen to you as a religious man yep. if you don't observe that they're not going to think you're from god they cannot separate their law and their observances and if you don't observe them you're not going to win a jew and so when he, he says to the those without the law he's talking about gentiles as without the law being not without law to god but under the law to christ that i might gain them that are without the law, but we know that Christ fulfilled the law. People often misunderstand the verse where he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, he did fulfill it and it is abolished in the sense 
that uh, he took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. Yeah, uh, true. That's, we, we're not justified by it. But see, they don't realize that that you have to read things in the con in in the consecutive order that they occurred. At that time, he hadn't come to abolish the law; he came to fulfill it. But it was fulfilled, um, and, and that's what people miss. So when the seed of Christ is in us, and He fulfilled the law, then the law is fulfilled in us. So uh, now that doesn't mean, obviously, that we go around committing adultery, lying and stealing. It just means we can't be justified by trying to keep parts of the law. It just doesn't happen. Uh, under the law of Christ means that we are in relationship with Christ. We answer to him. Uh, so it says that I might gain them that are without the law. That just means uh, Jews and Gentiles. It's just a fancy way of saying that. And then when he's with the Jews, he's going to observe the law. When he's with the Gentiles, he will not observe the law. Mm -hmm. That's why he was saying to Peter, you know, you're being a hypocrite because you. Uh, but the difference is Paul would be clear to say if there were Jews and Gentiles eating together, he wouldn't pretend to be observant of the law and say he doesn't eat with Gentiles. He would just uh, he would be honest about it and eat with the Gentiles. Peter was trying to pretend that he always kept the observances. And that was hypocritical. As if the Gentiles were filthy and they, he couldn't eat with them. So that was the day. He's just saying he will observe whatever customs make people feel comfortable. So it's not a stumbling block for them here in the gospel. Yeah. You know, <laughs> We could play a game. I mean, it's probably I shouldn't call it playing a game because it's much more serious. Uh, but I, if we were to ask ourselves and discuss our favorite apostles and why, and and our, and the apostles, you know, our our let's say criticism of apostles and why, um, uh, not much comes to mind with Paul that I could. Uh, criticize uh, off the top of my head. There's only one thing that I questioned, uh, if you want to know. But with when I contrast uh, Paul and Peter, uh, Paul was very, very thoughtful. Uh, he, and of course, the, there is a difference too, not only in personality, but in scholarship. Paul was maybe the most I don't know if there's anybody more learned in the, uh, any writer in the, uh, the the books of the Bible than, than Paul, uh, but he was very well uh, uh, schooled, uh, not only in the scriptures but in uh, all the writings of philosophers. And and um, Peter was a fisherman. Uh, I'm sure he learned something about the scriptures, probably knew a lot about it because most of the Jewish people who took their Judaism seriously did study the scriptures. But I doubt it was on the level that Paul had. Uh, but the personality, Peter was impulsive. He was always doing something like, hey, uh, uh, don't say don't say you're going to be crucified and, and die. We won't let that happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And, Cutting off people's ears. Yeah, Peter decided that he's going to fight when they're going to take Jesus. <laughs> he cuts off the guy's ear, you know, and Jesus says, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Jumping in the water. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, so all these things, I mean, but what he, his impulsiveness also was helpful in that one event where he was the one that said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he, he made that, the water. Yeah, he, he made that declaration. But he uh, he made a lot of uh, um, what do you call it? Just, foot and mouth. Yeah, foot and mouth and stuff like that. And Paul, uh, the only thing I can think of about Paul that makes me wonder about a hypocrisy and, and maybe why, or if he did it for any reason or for his safety, because you know they had all put a put a uh, contract on Paul's life. But when James told him to go in and, and uh, do this ceremony and shave his head, and Paul conceded to do it, uh, that was disappointing to me. Maybe you can make me 
tell me why I should feel better about that. That's the only thing I could think about Paul that I, I question. But um, uh, when he talks about how he he's so careful, to, he's not going to do anything that could taint his ministry. Uh, he, he, he'd rather work and, and make tents and so he can't be accused of being in it for the money, you know. Um, all right, I, I forgot to uh, go read the Amplified and give Crips a turn, I think. Let me see. I'm going to read 20 and 21, Crip. And uh, by the way, if you want to respond to what I just said, anybody? Okay, I'll go to 20 and 21 in the, in, in the Amplified. I did want to say one thing about the Apostles. I yeah. love uh, Apostle John because he boasted in Christ's love for him always, not his own love for God. Yes, yes, yeah. And I was thinking when I started talking about the apostles, I was thinking of uh, Peter, jo uh, Paul, and John. And uh, don't forget Ringo. Remember Ringo? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. The lesser known apostle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, Paul and Mary. John, uh, I, I don't see anything but, but uh, praiseworthy uh, things for John. Uh, and uh, so I'm glad you said that. I meant to say that. Okay, in the in the in the Amplified, verse 20 and 21, Crips. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To men under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. Now, to those without uh, outside law, I became as one without law. Not that I am without the law of God and lawless toward him, but that I am especially keeping within and committed to the law of Christ that I might win those who are without law. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is pretty clear and Renee did a good job of explaining it. But, um, so it's, it's, it's being who he needs to be in a group of people that observe a certain set of laws or, or, or not, um, it'd be in in today's uh, terminology. It'd be the same thing of going over to someone's house, and you know that they're all vegetarians. They they're they're very serious about that. I mean, it's it's not a great example, but it's 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 um, not being a vegetarian. Me not being a vegetarian and going over to uh, being invited in uh, into a family's home for dinner, knowing that they're all vegetarians and they're very very strong strongly against uh, the eating of meat and whatever else. And for me to not make a stink about it and to, to, for me to um, be happy eating salad and, and uh, fake meat and, and all that stuff. Um, it's just an example of how I would, uh, for me, I can eat meat. I'm not, I'm not not eating meat because I've got a problem with it. I'm doing it to, to not being a, not be a stumbling block or an offense uh, to them. Uh, it's just an example, but he's saying that uh, simply when he uh, was preaching to the to the Jews, he would observe the same things that they observed. Um, I think it's been it been explained well. And then when when with, with the Gentiles, uh, he would do that. But the bottom line is that uh, he's only under one law, and that's the law of Christ. That That's it. He's not under any other law. He's not under the Mosaic law. He's made that clear, and neither are we. Uh, we're simply we're simply to follow the law of Christ, and that's it. Um, and then I'll just I'll throw on top of that, uh, Renee. You you picked John, and that was for me as well. And it's simply because of of the way that he uh, taught the love version of things, rather than just focusing in on 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 just the sin. Um, I, I, I look at God as, as being someone that loves us very much. And it's not to the point of saying, well, he doesn't care about whether we sin or not. It's not, that's not the point. The point is that, um, that, that John goes to a lot of trouble to express love. And I think that you expressed it well, Renee, and I would agree with you on that. It's not that I dislike Paul. And the only problem I have with Paul, I've expressed on this actual show, and that is that um, he went a little too far, and this is just my opinion um, uh, about uh, trying to tell people not to get married and stuff like that. And I'm biased when it comes to that. Um, I believe you can you can 
your life can be an example. You can your life can be a ministry whether you're married or not. Um, so that'd be my the only problem I would have, with Paul. It's not even really a problem. It's just a difference of opinion. He knows more than I do, though, because I didn't see Christ on the road anywhere. Uh, I didn't see him with my own eyes or hear him with my own my own ears. Um, so he has an advantage. I also haven't been to heaven either. <laughs> well, you got a lot of damn gall. I know, there, right? <laughs> you know, criticizing and saying Paul's wrong about something. I yeah. noticed Matthias said he was so wrong about something a couple of weeks ago. I forgot what it was, but... Hmm. All right, uh, I th you know you've heard me talk about this quite a few times uh, that uh, even though I'm a KJV firstist, uh, the KJV is what I test the other translations against. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the one I trust the most, but also it has uh, verses that many of the other modern translations have either omitted or footnoted, uh, and I want all the verses uh, to be considered. Uh, particularly some very important verses, uh, 1 John 5, 7, 2 Tim, uh, Timothy uh, 3, 16, and, you know, those, and many more like those that are critical verses. And uh, uh, so the KJV is what we read first and we trust it and we measure the others against it. But, but I also have to say that the KJV is written in an archaic English that is uh, not the way we talk today. And many people struggle with it. And even myself, I'm educated, uh, but I uh, uh, I don't understand the KJV often uh, as well as I understand the, the, the modern translations. And when I look at the difference between 20 and 21 here in the KJV and 20 and 21 in the Amplified, the Amplified makes it absolutely much more clear, even though the main points in the KJV you get but it's also like a Rubik's tube trying to sort it all out the way he's explaining yeah. it. So I think that uh, when you read in the Amplified, it really makes it very clear what Paul's saying there. But let's look at the footnote um, for the uh, NABRE, uh, verse 19 through 23, the footnote is, in a rhetorically balanced series of statements, Paul expands and generalizes the picture of his behavior and explores the paradox of apostolic freedom. It is not essentially freedom from restraint, but freedom for service, mm. a possibility of constructive activity. Yeah. And he's going to go on demonstrating this, uh, how he, you know, uh, some people could say Paul's being a hypocrite being all things to all people and the way he modifies himself. And you might say he's unprincipled and, and stuff, but uh, really what you really need to learn from it is, uh, you know, clarified in the next few verses too. Yeah. You wouldn't say that if you understand freedom in Christ. If you understand for the freedom we have in Christ, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that, that he's being hypocritical at all. I wouldn't say it. I'm saying that some people say. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, agreeing with you. I'm saying, yeah, absolutely. If you understood the freedom that we have, then uh, a person wouldn't say that. Okay, so while you're talking here, uh, let's go with uh, 22. I got to do that one. I didn't do 21. Oh, you didn't do 20, 20 uh, and 21? I did 20, but I, did, I didn't say 21. I but, thought we did 20 and 21 together. You did, I, only did the first half? Yes, sir. I'm sorry about oh, that. Please, please go ahead. Um, I, I wanted to um, agree with Crips for bringing up when it says with – the week I became as weak and I might gain the week I'm glad he put that in context because Paul mentions earlier that uh, a brother that still thinks he's under the uh, food laws or worries that a pagan who might have offered their food to their household pagan god uh, an idol is going to corrupt their food and therefore they're doing you know they got something to worry about and that just means they're weak in the faith, not understanding that uh, their freedom in Christ. And so uh, Paul, you know, says, you know, hey, it's better to not eat or eat that in front of them because they're weak. Don't, you know, uh, enforce your liberty upon them. Right. So when it says weak, it's clearly saying they're not they're, they're not aware of the liberty they have. And that is followed up on the heels saying I became as a Jew 
and then I became as those without the law. So he's uh, uh, mentioning, and when he says that uh, I became as a Jew, again, I'm assuming it's the observances, yeah. Yeah. you know, the ritual observances. So uh, I wanted to confirm that I agree with him. So to, to the weak, I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So uh, just like a perfect example of this is when he was at Mars Hill preaching to the Athenians and used their own superstition of they, they had a, a, a to the unknown God. So they had an altar made up to, to this unknown God just in case there was a God they didn't know about that they would offend. And so Paul used their own beliefs to open the door to preach Christ to them, saying, this unknown God you ignorantly worship, he's the one I'm preaching to you. And so it opened the door. He became all things to all men there. But I think, was it you, Luke? That told me about a guy that did drugs with somebody because he took this to the extreme yeah. and said, I, I'm going to go get high with these people. And that was, come on, that was in a lame excuse to sin. Bottom line, lame excuse to sin. He knew better than that. But some people take this to the extreme like that. They will partake in uh, bad habits saying, oh, I'm just becoming all things to all men. And uh, that, that's that's pretty twisted. But uh, I think that I, I wanted to just clarify that week um, that had to be put in context. And that was probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I hadn't yet read verse 22, but I'll, I'll, let me read the KJV and then I'll ask and I'll read in the Amplified for Crips. Um, to the week became. Oh, I my am gosh. I had the numbers mixed up. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> Sorry, brother. All right. <laughs> All right, you read it, but let me read it and then contrast it with the the amplified uh, crypts. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now, when it says I made, uh, I made, I am made all things to all men. That particular part right there is uh, used by a lot of people. We all talk about that all the time. How does it say it in the Amplified, verse 22? Uh, to the weak, wanting in discernment, I have become weak, wanting in discernment. That I might win the weak and overscrupulous. I have, in short, become all things to all men, that I might, by all means, at all costs and in any and every way save some by winning them to faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, that term is used a lot. And I've even heard the, the, the other way it's been said is you can't be all things to all people. Some people have, have, have come to the conclusion that you can't be all things to all people. The reason they say that is because there's always somebody that regardless of whether you follow their laws and you go along with everything that that uh, they want you to, they're still going to have a problem with you. And I think that's true. I, there's always going to be someone that no matter what you do, they're, they're going to, they're going to have a, a, a bee in their bonnet or a, a burr under their saddle when it comes to you for sure. Um, but yeah, so it's just uh, R Renee uh, went a little early and we all understand that. And, and, and she made some uh, good points about this uh, verse already. Um, but it does tie into what he said before and what we've gone over in these studies about um, eating at someone else's house and, you know, so as not to be a stumbling block. Uh, even though you're giving up some of your freedom, you're actually not giving up your freedom. What you're, what you're realizing is you're operating in your freedom by allowing yourself to not eat meat if, if that's the, the custom of the house. Um, you're not lording your freedom over people and, and demanding to eat a steak in front of them uh, as to be a stumbling block to them. You're operating in your freedom in a way that is, um, is selfless and it's graceful, in my opinion. And so that's what he's saying here. To the weak, I became as the weak uh, to win the weak. And his, his bottom line point is that 
if he does that, if, 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 he, if he's a Jew with Jews and a Gentile with the Gentiles, he may not save all, but some are going to see that. They're going to understand what he's doing. Uh, and, you know, if they follow him enough and they read his letters enough, they're going to see that he's under freedom, that he considers himself free when it comes to the law of Christ. Mm -hmm. And to see him make that demonstration, it will save some. And I think that's true today as well. If people know that we're we're free to do what we like, that we have freedom in Christ, and they see that we're being respectful of them. I mean, okay, it's a silly example, but if someone knows that I'm not a vegetarian, but they invite me over to their house anyway, and I'm happy to eat whatever food they put in front of me, that might endure my I might endure myself to them. They they might think, oh my my gosh, this is this is graceful of him that even though he's a big time steak and burger eater. He's willing to eat, um, uh, you know, vegetables and uh, salad while he's at our house. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just being a good example, I think. I think he's Paul's great example here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Matthias uh, uh, told me about a uh, time he uh, put this principle to, to practice um, one time that is, uh, was interesting and uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that now, Matthias, but if you if you are, want to do it, uh, go ahead and let us know. All right, then. Let's go on. Becoming all things to all men, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Hi, Matthias, I didn't even know you were sitting at the computer. I'm so sorry I didn't say hi. <laughs> well, I'm sitting in the back. Um, there, were, there was a time when you told me you modified your behavior on a public broadcast once in a way that would and, and to apply that principle to make people feel at ease. Uh, well, there's a couple different ways and times. Like if somebody uses, you know, foul language, I won't go foul with it, but I'll I'll ease up my language to where they feel comfortable. Same with, um, uh, you know. I've found this verse to hit home when I was door knocking and I would see that the, uh, the people, uh, and I'm not promoting my bad habit. I'll, I'll go ahead and say that, but I would see that they'd have a cigarette smoking station outside their door and showing them that I wasn't this pompous, what they're used to when people come with the Bible, uh, trying to preach to them. I asked them if I could take a break from going to the next door and if they'd sit down and have a cigarette with me. And while I wouldn't do that in front of everybody all the time, but if I could see that that's what they were doing and that was at their, it was at their house, they had, you know, a little couple chairs and an ashtray. Well, what I would do is show them that I'm just as real and show become all things to all men in that manner as well even though it is a bad habit of mine but it's something that i don't promote i don't share i don't talk about because i don't want it to be a stumbling stone for people but if they're already in it then i could uh i could do things like that so there's several different ways that i try to meet people at their level show them that they just got to go to christ as they are who they are and just learn and and get to know him mm -hmm. and not trying to do anything else so i i've I, i'm not sure exactly what you're talking about luke so you can share it but <laughs> i've tried to use this principle in many ways because it's when we get real with people that's when they get real with jesus mm -hmm. Uh, no, that was the uh, that was what I had in mind. I didn't know if you wanted to um, use it, but uh, I, I think that in that case, Paul would give you a thumbs up. You're, you're applying that principle, uh, and uh, it's to uh, you know why does he do it? Why does he become all things to all people to find some common ground? You know, I was professional salesman for 17 years, and uh, I. I I was very good. I, I every year I won sales awards, and uh, uh, there, there are techniques. And, and one of the foundations of selling is first you've got to find some common ground and, and uh, with people and sell yourself and make them like you. And, and, and if you have something in common, you try to find that and identify. And so that's the principle Paul is using, and you you've used it. So 
All right, let's uh, let's go on now to uh, 23 in the KJV. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Uh, I'll read more because that is just nothing new there. But verse 24, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Well, I got to tell you about how some a friend of mine interpreted this, but I don't want to go first. Um, Renee, why don't you go first on verse yeah, 24? Boy. This, is where, this is the part they start twisting all the way to the end. And they will use this section to say, Paul is saying that he will lose salvation. And I just want to remind people that Salvation is not a prize. Salvation is not a reward. And you have to read this whole chapter to see what he's talking about. He mentions a reward. He mentions a prize up earlier. Now, it's not clear what the prize is, although there is some reference uh, in these next few verses. But I just wanted to get people to, to pay special attention to these next few verses we're going to go over. So he says, uh, you know, I, I, and this I do for the gospel's sake. So he's becoming all things that I might be partaker thereof with you. Right. He's, he's going to be a partaker of what? Of the gospel. Of of seeing people saved through the gospel. And then he says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Now we see the in the scriptures that said it's not of him that will it, or of him that runneth, but of God who showeth mercy. Boom. So when it says, so run that you may obtain, but salvation's not of him that runs, he cannot be talking about salvation here. Mm. So he's just saying, keep your eye on the prize. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, um, let's look at verse uh, 24 in the Amplified Crips. Uh, it says, um, do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run your race that you may lay hold of the prize and make it yours. Yeah, um, I, I agree that it's not uh, salvation, and I agree with what Renee said, and, and that uh, people twist this all the time, and they try to try to say, and in these these verses coming up about losing your salvation, which clearly no one on that on this panel believes that uh, that we can lose it. Um, it's not it, we can't lose something that was given to us by by God. It's not based on our running any kind of race. Uh, we do have to make it through this broken, fallen world. We have to um, continue to preach the gospel. We have to make it through tribulations that that come against us and. Uh, through persecution to the end, we have to we have to do all of that. It's tough. It's tough. This 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 world that we live in now, even even though we're not being killed for the gospel like they were uh, during Paul's time, um, you know uh, he he would face death. Paul would face death for um, believing the gospel, uh, for preaching the gospel. He he would pay the ultimate price with his own life. So, uh, what greater reward does does a person have than that? That gives up gives up his own life for staying true, running the race in the way that Paul did. Um, but we run the the same race even now, even though the consequences may not be the same as of yet. I do believe, biblically speaking, if we live long enough, uh, we may face that as well. Um, certainly, our children or our grandchildren will, in my opinion. Uh, but either way, the race that we're running isn't to uh, obtain uh, salvation. It's, it's as I said, I believe, my opinion is, based on what I've read in context, is that we, um, 
we have to make it through this life. We have to get to the end of whatever our end is. Um, stay true and follow follow him and learn more from him and seek his face and preach the gospel to other people. That's the race that that, that I run. Um, and I'm not doing it because I, for some reward, though I know I'll be grateful just to be in heaven, honestly. And uh, whatever reward he decides to give me, whatever isn't burned up, it, I owe it all to him anyway, uh, because it's him doing it in me and it's not because I'm a great dude. Okay, I think you're a great dude. Uh, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about this verse, I, I wonder if anybody else has ever heard anybody interpret the way I'm going to tell you now. It shocked me when I heard it, but Bible Jim, I mentioned him earlier. He's the leader of the Street Preachers of America group, and and uh, um, I, I got to know him very well for many years. And uh, he actually wrote a couple, several books that I edited for him. But he uh, he actually uh, interprets this verse here as that uh, this is an, actually a competition to get the prize. In other words, that <laughs> not all of us are building up treasures in heaven and everybody's going to get them based upon how much they've done uh, or or not get them if you haven't done much. But but he thinks it's an individual thing and then one person's going to get the prize. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. And in the Amplified, it says... Uh, do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So the way he was interpreted is that you know there's only one prize, and and we're all in competition against each other to work real hard in our ministries to see who gets that prize. Uh, I, I, but the point here, obviously, you could interpret that way if you're not looking at really the point Paul's making, and you get it if you look at the footnote here in the NABRE. Let's look at the uh, verse 24 through 27 footnote. It says, a series of many parables from sports appealing to readers familiar with Greek gymnasia and the nearby Isthmian games. That, that's all we should be looking at this. It's not, it's not to be taken literally like there's one prize. Right. He's showing us an example in sports of of, uh, of 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 you know competing to, to get to win the prize. It's not that we're all competing for one prize like in a sport, but right. he's just using it as a as a you know you shouldn't. This is not something to be taken literally to form a doctrine that we're competing for this one prize. They get that's where they get that's where they get Bema from from the uh, early Olympics. You know, I, I see exactly what you're saying, and that and that is exactly uh, what you there. Yeah. Uh, because the, the the crowns were were like these little um, laurels, twigs. Yeah, like your little twigs and ivy on their head. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, let's go to the KJV for verse twenty five. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, mm -hmm. but we an incorruptible. I mm -hmm. uh, forgot who's turned first to go first. I think it's Renee. No, it's Cripps' turn first, right? I think it's Renee. I think Renee, go first on 25, please. There you go. Yeah, that's what uh, this just uh, confirms what you were saying, Brother Luke, when he's using the uh, Olympics, who's based on the Olympians, the, uh, the sports competitions they had, whoever won got a crown of of like what do you call them Laurel, the, laurels yeah crown yeah, of the little ivy things they wore on their head like caesars did uh yeah. and that crown was corruptible yeah. it perished it was you know made of leaves and flakes and so forth but even if it was made of something like gold eventually that mm -hmm. uh even perishes mm -hmm. as all the elements will uh <laughs> so to me uh, uh, there's several crowns mentioned in scripture and we often hear about how we're going to cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus, uh, you know, cause we don't deserve to be there to begin with less right. any kind of reward, which we get. 
-hmm. And some believe that it's symbolic and others believe that it's literal. But I believe that it's pretty clear in scripture as Jesus said, build your treasures in heaven. I believe in a literal reward of position or something yeah. um, in, in the eternal realm because I believe in a literal kingdom, which is spiritual, but it is also literal. So um, every man strives for the mastery, is temperate in all things. Just saying that they're focused, they uh, um, strive for the mastery. It's like you want to be good at one thing, you're going to focus on that thing and be the best at it. And the context here is soul winning. And I did a video before on this saying the prize could also be looked at as the soul's that he saves because he talks about being partakers thereof with them and becoming all things to all men so that he can gain them. Um, and so in one, one aspect, the prize is souls being saved to Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, he's making it clear here that it's a, uh, a prize of a crown. And I believe that there is some kind of reward for soul winners. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what he's referencing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, verse 25 in the Amplified reads, Now every athlete who goes into training conducts himself temperately mm -hmm. and restricts himself in all things. They do it to win a wreath that will soon wither, but we do it to receive a crown of eternal blessedness that cannot wither. Yeah, so... so um, I'm sure a lot of people are aware that if you're running for the Olympics, then you're you're um, choosing certain diets, you're lifting weights, you're you're practicing running, you're doing all sorts of stuff. You're living in a different way. And these people don't don't be deceived. They train hours and hours and hours a day uh, for these these events. Uh, they're in better shape than a lot of us here, at least than me. I'll just speak for myself. Someone that's running in the Olympics is obviously in great, great shape, and they work to get that. They, they, they might have good genetics, and there are certain people predisposed to do these uh, sorts of things. You know, they just they just have better genetics, and they're they're able to to do that. But they they do train, and they uh, moderate their choices based on that. Um, and uh, so Paul's just making the point that yeah. And then they amplified is saying they're disciplined, exercise, self-control and all things. So he's telling us to do that too. Again, it's just to follow the, the, the law of Christ that we know and to follow the things that we know are right in the sight of God and that we do that not for some uh, temporal crown, not for something, not for laurels, not for riches, not for anything else, but for whatever it is. That we that we receive as a reward that doesn't burn up, um, and, and uh, I just want to touch briefly on the idea. I, I you know it, whether it's literal, uh, whether it's a literal crown that we throw at his feet or not. Either way, it doesn't matter because uh, I believe that uh, Scripture is bearing out the fact that we know those of us that are there in the first place that we're not relying on our own works and we're not putting ourselves under the law as if that 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 um, our righteousness is good enough. We're relying solely on what Christ did that we know by very by the very virtue of being there in the first place, that it's all what he did through us and that it's not anything from us that we give it back to him. And I don't know this for sure. It's not borne out in scripture, but I believe we throw it at his feet and I believe that he gives it back to us. And it's because of his mercy and grace, not because of, not because of any any part of us is good. It's because of how much he loves us. Yeah, um, it, it's, I think it's important for us to know that we he, he's not telling us to become athletes. Right. He's telling us that the the principles of working hard at your in athletics. Mm -hmm. These same principles can be uh, used by us mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, it says here. Um, now, every athlete goes into training, conducts himself temperately, 
and restricts himself in all things. So the idea of uh, you applying that to our lives, let's conduct ourselves temperately yeah. and restrict ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of, it's a discipline. Yeah. And, and that's what the word disciple is. As a disciple, we discipline ourselves to, to do as Jesus and Paul are instructing us to try to live our lives in these ways, mm -hmm. uh, not only because it's pleasing to God, but, uh, but also, as Renee says, this is all talking about winning souls, and uh, we need to uh, sometimes uh, restrict ourselves in some ways for the benefit of, of conveying the gospel to others. Maybe abstain from, from, from meat when you're at a person's house that uh, it would offend them. But you can restrict yourself in that way and, 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 and um, as a disciple. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's go to the last two verses. All right. We'll be able to finish this up. 20, in, the, in, the, in the KJV, uh, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, yes. lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Oh, I know Renee's dying to go on this, but I think it's Cripp's turn to go first. <laughs> she can go. This doesn't bother Renee, me. Renee, why don't you go first? Because I know this is the verse you've been waiting for. Yeah. yeah, well, all of it really is. And, and we've uh, made our point. A lot of people say, see, Paul was scared of losing his salvation or not making it. And it's obvious this, this chapter is not talking about running to obtain a prize or reward of salvation, but souls being saved and for an incorruptible crown. So uh, he puts his body under subjection as he become a castaway. It's in the sight of other men. Because the context here is he becomes all things to all people. He becomes as a Jew, or he becomes as a Gentile, he becomes weak, uh, lest he become a castaway. They, they will not uh, uh, receive the message of the gospel. And uh, it's possible, he's talking about not obtaining the prize, which is winning their soul and or possible crown. So he's not saying that God is going to cast them away. The context here has nothing to do with God uh, saving anyone, but about his uh, ability to save souls and preach the gospel to others. So it, it'd be wrong contextually to take this one little verse out, out of context, and say, See, Paul said he was going to be a castaway, that God was going to cast him away, and he was going to lose his salvation, when the entire chapter talking about soul winning and becoming what's necessary so that others will believe the gospel and as far as not as one that beats the air he's saying uh you're not doing this in vain yeah you know you have a goal in mind mm -hmm. all right brother Cripps, let's just stick with the kjv on this 26 and 27 yeah, I, I agree. The, the, the point that uh, Rene just made is the one that uh, means the most to me. He's not doing this in vain, that all the stuff that he's mentioned in the, in the entire chapter, um, all the things he's, he's mentioned in the in, entire book so far, all the things that we do to not be a stumbling block, all the things that we do, whether we're married or, or unmarried, the ministry that we do, um, running the race and witnessing to others, um, putting up with persecution, all of the things that we do as a believer are not beating the air. They're for a purpose, and the purpose is to give glory to God first and foremost. Uh, whatever the reward is, um, it's it's going to be well worth uh, moderating our behavior, following the law of Christ, um, loving others, bearing one another's burdens, all the things that we do. Uh, as we exemplify the life of Christ himself when we do that and as the Holy Spirit uh, grows in us and changes us and makes us into the likeness of Christ, all of that is worth it. It's worth it um, for, the, for the reward that is un incorruptible. It's not a temporal reward. It is a crown that no one will ever take away um, no one will ever take away the, the whatever treasures we are, whatever rewards God gives us that aren't burnt, burnt up. Um, 
They're ours. They're ours. But and again, uh, it's because of His love and mercy for us. It's not because we deserve anything. Yeah. Well, Renee is our untwisted sister, and uh, she thankfully is untwisting all these scriptures for the ver people that really need help. And this happens to be one of the verses that some, so many people are twisting that uh, you see even Paul is afraid he might lose his salvation. But it, uh, as Renee keeps pointing out, the context of this is not salvation. The context is rewards and prizes uh, and rewards for our ministries as evangelists. So, uh, uh, what does it mean, mean to be cast away? Well, I would say that that would be the person that goes to the judgment seat of Christ and find that it's wood, hay, and stubble. Yes. Yeah. That's all it could mean. He is not talking about cast away from Jesus and rejected. Depart from me, I never knew you. It's cast away saying, wow, you're, uh, you, you didn't build up gold, silver, and precious gems. You just built up wood, hay, and stubble. That's, the, uh, that's what it means. You sought a corruptible crown. Yeah. You yeah. saw a corruptible crown. You you in your lifetime that you were given, you heaped up think temporal things and you you made your life about what I need right now rather than thinking about what you might uh might gain eternally by um by beating your flesh into submission, by mm -hmm. uh keeping your body and, and using moderation and following uh the idea of uh Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got through the, the chapter. Uh, we went a few minutes overboard, but uh, we I think it's important to finish it up. So uh, uh, let me see. Is there anything? Well, it looks like Hendricks has a question. He always likes to give us a question as we're finishing. So I'm going to have to uh, save his question. Uh, could there be a significant? I have one for, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, could there be a significance with referring to Jacob and not his other name, Israel, in reference to Jacob's trouble? Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'm going to copy it, Hendrix. I'll put it on our list for questions, but we don't. We're running late tonight, so we'll we'll have to answer that on a Sunday program. Okay, Renee, uh, uh, do you want to deal with anything in the chat room, or do you uh, ready to give a summary? Yeah, I was just going to tell Ryan. Uh, I will answer your question more in depth about this generation will not pass i'll do that tonight before i go to bed because it's relatively short and i'll i'll untwist that that scripture real quick for you out on my channel yeah okay uh renee will you give us a summary of uh, your thoughts on the the study tonight yeah i love this chapter because it all fit together and it was a perfect way to show context uh as Paul is, is bringing his thoughts together at the end. As uh, Jason points out, he, when he makes a point over and over again, he says it in many different ways, so the point's not missed. And so it's amazing to me how the point's still missed. Yeah. And people will take that whole section completely out of context, you pull that one verse out, you know, um, to mean something it doesn't mean. Uh, yeah. Bible truly is a discerner of hearts. So I'm glad we were able to get through the entire chapter. Uh, because at once, so that you could see, we stayed in the vein of what the context was, and that was soul winning. Yep. All about uh, uh, doing what we have to do to get the gospel to others. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, give us a summary. Yeah, it would just be real quick. This is a, it's a good uh, it was a good uh, study, and um, I uh, I uh, I like that Paul. Uh, goes to the trouble of, of uh, stating the same thing in different ways. Because as Renee pointed out, we sh we still don't get it. I mean, there are people out there that still don't get it. And they uh, cherry pick scriptures and they do it to prop up their own version of things, their own interpretation of things, uh, what they feel is right. And what is right for them is <laughs> still trying to base it on their own works in some way. And of course, if you're if you're living like that, if you're basing it on your own works, then of course you're afraid that you can have your salvation uh, taken away because um, you're not basing it on the rock. You're not basing it on the true gift of salvation, which cannot be taken away. And nothing can take uh, that away from us. Uh, once the gift is given, God is is not someone that takes the gift back. 
or uh, it's something that um, we we can't walk away from. Um, yeah, so good uh, good stuff, and um, I think the the point that he, he's making overall too is a good one. Let's just moderate ourselves and and keep running the race. And the race isn't for salvation; it's uh, witnessing and being a witness, being salt and light to the rest of the world um, in a broken and fallen world, and continuing to do that. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we all have the ability to do that. And um, I, for one, am grateful. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to summarize the study. I just wanted to make a remark here. I, I'm thankful that uh, Hendricks was there. Uh, Hendricks, if you're still there, maybe uh, you missed you, you missed the beginning. And because you weren't there, I got concerned and asked everybody to pray for you. And uh, shortly after that, you showed up. So maybe, I don't know what happened, but I'm glad you were able to make it. I'm glad you're okay. All right. So... Um, uh, that'll that'll be the end of the study tonight. Uh, we'll be pick it up with ch uh, chapter ten, verse one next Wednesday. Um, Renee, are you have on your program tomorrow night. Yep, sure. Okay. Am. Join Renee at nine thirty Eastern time tomorrow night for her uh, what a Throwdown Thursday, and uh, join us Friday for the Fellowship Friday program nine thirty Eastern time. And uh, all right. Uh, also, don't don't forget to. Uh, jo join uh, Brother Cripps on uh, the uh, the 9 p.m. Eastern on Sunday for uh, True Story Live. They're going to be concluding the uh, uh, the uh, last leg of their uh, original programming before they move on in a new direction. So you don't want to miss that. No, oh, thanks, Brother Luke. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you to the chat room, to the congregation, and to Renee and Cripps. Uh, and uh, Brother Matthias, would you want to say any final remarks or a good night to everybody? Thank you for. Good night and God bless everybody. Okay. All right. All right, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>